Alright, hey guys, how you doing? This is Flood here. I've uh, wanted to do some educational content for a little bit now, as I don't think there's really that much stuff that really explains in depth what competitive PUBG is like, and how to get better, and all that stuff for a, for a while, so I want to do this for a while. <clears throat> but anyway, so today's episode is just the first episode, so a lot of people will actually just understand this already. This is some really simple stuff, but I'm trying to make a stepping stone and just really build the foundation so when I talk about stuff in future episodes, there's no confusion and people know exactly what I'm talking about. So for this episode, we're going to talk about team roles and how a lot of competitive players uh, form their playstyles, so how a lot of players play. And we'll also talk about the types of roles that each team has. Um, just for some information, um, this is based on my experience and understanding. I'm not 100% correct. I'm never 100% correct. But uh, this is my understanding, I've talked, everyone who I've mentioned or used pictures of in this video, I've asked them and they've approved. So, yep, thank you for that understanding. So, we'll get started. Alright, so just to quickly brush over the content for today. Uh, for the first slide, we're going to talk about fundamentals and what a lot of pro players do really well and maybe what you guys need to do if you want to get better at the game. Now, we have the six main roles that I think covers a huge portion of players. I think every player kind of fits somewhat into these roles. It's also important to note that you can have you can be multiple of these roles. Like, for example, Mime is a really good frontman, and he's also a fantastic co-IGL. Then you have Varello, who played, who's our, who's our IGL, but uh, for a good portion of his career, he's played more of a supportive role. Um, so yeah, there's everyone can have multiple roles. You know, it's kind of just like the play style you have, and of course, you can have more than one play style. So yeah, we'll go over these roles quickly, and if you do already know how these roles work and what they're like, that's fine. There's a bit of homework at the end for next episode. Um, not for next episode, sorry, just for just in general to make sure you understand the content, and then uh, we will continue. Alright, for some of the fundamental skills that we need to achieve in order to become a better PUBG player and a better competitive player, there's about, I'd say 10 or 11 that are really important. I, I put 11 down here, and there's a few critical ones that we need to think about. We really need to focus on having clear communication, we need to be able to relay information to our callers and make sure we're giving clear, clear and uh, correct information. We need to be scouting efficiently. We can't waste time. Like PUBG and competitive PUBG is all about, it's a game about speed. Teams who do stuff properly quickly usually do better. And then of course, the last one is decisiveness. I've honestly just put this in critical because our team struggles with this. And I think if we got better at this, we'd be a much better team. So that's why I think decisiveness is really important. But anyway, I mean, it's critical, not important. For some important skills, I think understanding fighting lines is uh, is really helpful as a player. I think that comes with experience and like understanding how the terrain works, understanding what positions lead to what other positions. But uh, we'll go over fighting lines in quite a bit of detail in future episodes. Then we have map knowledge, uh, just understanding terrain, which is really important to um, to be a beneficial player and add value to your team in terms of ideas. And then, of course, individual mechanics. You need to make sure you are able to hit the easy shots and, of course, try and hit some hard shots too. And just a few helpful skills that'll really make you a better team player is uh, having great discipline. So knowing when to peak, knowing when not to peak. Creativity is really important. Like, I think Snakers is a fantastic player who's just, like, really creative. He'll throw out some random ideas that are just really, really good. So being creative and thinking out of the box, same with Mime, he does that a lot. And uh, another thing is you want to be aware of your teammates and yourself. So you should be looking at your map, checking where your teammates are, look where they're looking. If you need to micromanage one of your teammates, you can. If they're doing something wrong or you foresee they're making a mistake, um, just make sure you're doing that in a positive way. Make sure you're being a positive player because no one wants to play on a team with someone who's mean. Trust me, positivity goes a long way. I would put it at critical for me personally, but I think for most players, it's just helpful to be positive, so keep that in mind. Alright, as far as the team roles and playstyles go, uh, there's I said there was six, and it covers like a huge range of like uh, different playstyles. So I think it covers like almost every player could identify to some degree with at least one of these six roles, if not multiple of the six roles. To be honest, most of the competitive public G players that are really good will be flex players, they'll be able to do everything. So that's what you want to aim for. You want to be a mixture of as many of these categories as you can. Each category has its strengths and what they're really good at. So if you can identify what you are good at as a player, then you might be able to try and fit yourself into a role and see where you fit in a team. 
So for, as far as the roles go, we have IGL. So I've put Rello down. He's a. I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about American uh, teams and players, by the way, because I'm not familiar with other other players from other regions. So I don't want to make incorrect assumptions. But I definitely think Rello's an IGL. He has been for a while. I think Luke Twelve's a good co IGL. I think Sparking's a fantastic fragger. I think Pixel's a really good support player. I think Shrimzy's probably the best flex player in all of America. I think he is just a consistent... I mean, I'm not going to glaze Shrimzy. I do that enough. But yeah, I, I think Shrimzy's a fantastic example of a flex player. And I think mine's a fantastic example of a scout and a front man. I think this guy literally created the front man play style in America. And he's like the pillar of like what people should aim to be like in terms of being a front man. Alright, so let's get into the more of the... A theory, I guess. There's really not that much theory, but just just discussing some things. So IGLs, like, they're usually the players that are most confident with how to play the game and how to position. So they're generally the smartest players, and they are the leaders on their team, right? Like IGLs want to lead their team, and they're all they're focused all about positioning and macro gameplay. So these players will usually be in their map quite a bit. So they don't usually ADR farm. That's usually the fraggers and other people's jobs. But uh, yeah, IGLs have huge, huge impact into in the early game and uh, mid game. Uh, I think they do a huge chunk of the decision making for the team easily in the 80%. I think uh, people can make suggestions, but usually this IGL will give the green light to plays and he'll really think about everything that's been said. IGLs need to be able to handle pressure and they need to be able to make decisions quickly and, eff and efficiently. So the, the, anyone who's an IGL, if you, if you think that you can handle pressure and you can make decisions based off information quickly, then it's uh, being an IGL is probably a good thing for you to do. But uh, yeah, usually IGLs are very vocal on how they want to play the game. These people want to have control over how they play. So these, these players are usually really, really organized and they know what they want to do. They know how they want to play the game and they just want to make sure their team's on the same page. So yeah, these guys are the leaders of the team. They usually um, orchestrate and begin a lot of the plays. I think a lot of really good teams, their IGLs are usually ones who start plays or try to start plays. So I guess you could kind of tie in a lot of IGLs as front men too. And uh, yeah, so we have Quinn as a picture. Quinn's a fantastic IGL as probably the most successful American IGL of all time. Yeah, probably. And then we have Purdy, he's just, you know, he's got that age and experience over everyone by like a long shot, you know, like a, a big age gap. So yeah, Purdy's a great example of an IGL as well. Alright, so going on to co-IGLs, co-IGLs are actually, in my opinion, just as valuable as IGLs sometimes. I think they are like a secondary leader and usually teams will appoint who they think a co-IGL should be and it's usually the player who is... Maybe just like very simple, like very close to as intelligent as the the main IGL, but they usually co IGLs are actually fantastic leaders when it comes to making plays. So I think a really good examples are like uh, Luke Twelve is really vocal about how he wants to play. I know Cow is super vocal when I played with Cow. He's really vocal about what needs to be done. He's a good leader. I think another really good example is Kickstart when he was on my team at United. I think he was a fantastic co IGL. He led whenever we need to do something in late game. He was saying. Listen to me, listen to me, we're doing this. So there's a huge chunk of uh, like collaboration. Co-IGLs and IGLs will make a huge, huge chunk. Like I would say like 90% on average of the decisions of the team. And they'll bounce off each other and make sure that their ideas uh, as as ironclad and as foolproof as possible. And uh, so th those two players usually do a big chunk of the calling. But the, the Co-IGL's main main really role when it comes to playing on a team is if there's situations where the IGL is anchoring for some, like there's always a chance that like any player can be anchor at a given time. But if the IGL is anchoring and he can't really see information in front of, in front of him or in front of them, they will be able to make the decision and the IGL will trust them. So these players actually have a lot of trust on their teams and they will be able to make a call and uh, everyone will listen, even the IGL. Like, they don't need the IGL's green light to make calls most of the time, especially if they're the one with the majority of the information. So yeah, if you, if you think you have a good, good game knowledge and you want to be vocal and you can lead, but you don't want to have the full reins of the ship, then I think maybe being a co-IGL might be something you should aim to. Aim to do, sorry. 
All right, so we have the most famous role, probably. Everyone knows this. Everyone loves the Draggers. Everyone thinks these players are the greatest gifts to God. I have put two really good examples. I think Snakers and Sparking are two phenomenal fraggers, and they seriously are so mechanically good. It's kind of crazy when I watch Snakers play sometimes. I don't know how this guy hits that many shots. Same with Sparking. I think Sparking is God tier as well. But the fraggers are usually the star player on the team. In terms of the face of the team, they don't necessarily have to be the star. I mean, they're usually the star because they statistically shine. But these players are the playmakers, they're the players that open stuff up, they get insane knocks, they're ready to fight, they're always looking to shoot and pressure people. So I think it was a fragger being someone who is willing to listen, even I mean, Snake is, is maybe not the best listener, but that's okay, he makes up for it. But listening is super important, and uh, fraggers just listen, and they don't have a huge impact on the macro of the game. They usually focus on doing what they're told, and uh, they just shoot and pressure opponents. These players are phenomenal ARs, phenomenal DMRs. And they just really, they just feed information to their team. They shoot and they listen. And that's basically what Frag will do. So if you think that you don't, you're not the smartest player. You, you, you can still be smart and be a Frag, don't get me wrong. But if you want to listen and you just want to let other people command you and you be led basically, then I think Frag is the best role. It does require a lot of effort and time to get mechanically that good. Like, honestly, it'll probably be impossible if you get mechanically as good as Snakers and Sparking in a short period of time. So you're gonna have to really put in the work if you wanna be a fragger. I think it's the easiest thing to slot into a team because it's just someone who's really mechanically good. Like, you don't have that much impact on the macro play. So it's not terribly important as long as you output damage, pressure, knocks, kills, and you're just feeding your information. That's all that matters as your fragger. All right, so we have another role which is kind of the opposite of fraggers in some sense. Uh, supports are usually, um, they're usually like, the, I guess the garbage men of teams, right? They're, they're usually really good as well. Like everyone on a team is good, like, but supports tend to do more of the boring duties in a team. They'll clear the edge. That in a 3-1 split, which we'll talk about in future episodes, They'll usually be the one, they're going to be sweeping the back, they're going to be making sure there's no threats coming in. So these players are usually really good at telling the team what type of threats they might be having and like where their resources need to be focused on. So these players are really good at getting off angles and uh, working angles, getting, getting little picks by being way off in nowhere so I think like a good example is like Pio kind of does that but he's also I mean the support and front men are kind of similar and some they have some overlap but I think the main difference between supports and front men is supports usually want to anchor and, and just because you're a support doesn't mean you get kills by the way this is just like a play style that people have usually supports prefer anchoring because they are much better with DMRs like these guys like I put Nikos in here because that guy was like an SLR demon. Like this these players are really good with um with DMRs, so they they'll sit themselves back and they'll play an anchor role because they know that they're confident uh, at mid to long range. All right, so the most important role that I think anyone and everyone should aim to achieve is becoming a flex player. And the reason I say this is because flex players are able to do a huge chunk of roles. They are like, they're able to do a, like almost all the roles, if not all the roles. And that's what makes them so consistent. They're able to consistently add value to their teams. They can support, they can entry frag, they can, they can be an aggressive scouter, they can IGL, they can lead, they can do pretty much everything. So this is where you want to, this is what you should be aiming for, because if you're not a dedicated IGL, you want to strive to become a flex player, someone who can do everything on the team. I do think it's not easy to become a flex player. I think you have to gain a lot of experience because you need to know how to play certain situations. So usually the more experienced players tend to be, have a more flexible play style. So that's why I put a picture of Shrimzy here. He has been, he's an extremely experienced player. He does... He does a lot for his t like his team in terms of uh, being consistent and adding value. So I think being consistent is is an asset in PUBG. I think PUBG is a game of averages. 
So yeah, you want to try and become a player like this who can do whatever needs to be done and is is very reliable. So so yeah, like this is what this is the ultimate goal of like learning. I think it's better to learn a few at once and then as you get more experience under your belt you'll slowly begin to cover more roles and be more comfortable with more playstyles. But it's really about identifying your own strengths and weaknesses. But um yeah flex players they're super reliable they do exactly what they're told they do what they they need to do they can command they can lead so yeah this is the best role to possibly be and I think a huge chunk of pros are flex players because a lot of pros have heaps of experience because the game's been out for a while. So yeah, and we'll continue. All right, we have the scouts and the front men. Now, these players are super selfless, right? These players only care about winning and getting advantages for their team, and if they have to die for that, they're more than willing to. So I put Mime as an example. I think on Sonics, he did this really well as well. I think a lot of fans and viewers could identify that, which is awesome. It's, it's fun to identify uh, roles and uh, how team, how players play. But yeah, so mine was is fantastic QCQ. Like, this guy wants to be in your face. He's getting in spoiler spots. Like, he's doing stuff that adds value without necessarily shooting all the time. So, sometimes one knock can open the whole game and get you a 10 kill win. So this is where frontmans and scouts, they, they risk their life a lot, and they're very risky sometimes with information and scouting, but their goal is to get, it's a high risk, high reward play, and this is what these players do. These players are super confident, QCQ, they're very confident as well in their own abilities. But I do think it's really important that in a team, you need to have at least one person who is willing to make plays and take risks the team in order to create opportunities so i think when you have a team structure and you discuss as a team like who is willing to take risks and who is better at it because some people aren't as good at taking risk and they die a lot so the, and the problem is there's so much like you have to play with it quite a, bo a lot sorry you have to really test the limits before you can get to that point so for example like i don't think i'm very good at doing what mime does so that's why i let mime do what he does because he's fantastic at it so yeah, scouts and frontmen, super important for information and beginning players. Um, they're very selfless. These players usually die first, though, unfortunately. But they're doing it for a good cause. Alright guys, this is the end of the episode. This is a really short, sweet episode. Not super detailed, and I'm sorry about that, but we're going to start at the, at the base. We're going to try and build as much detail and as many layers of competitive PUBG as I possibly can to give you guys a better overview on how to understand and uh, watch the game and get more enjoyment out of it. So anyway, we'll have some homework if, if you guys want to do some. So I think uh, the first thing you can do is maybe pick a team or two or three, who knows, and try and uh, identify what roles and like what type of play styles each player fits into. I think it is important to note that most teams, especially at the high end, will have a lot of flex players. But there is usually one or two roles that kind of stand out from the rest. So even though they can do everything, there's usually one or two roles that kind of stand out. Anyway, we can uh, also maybe try and identify your own strengths and see what playstyle you might share. And then ask a friend or a player you know what they think you do well and see if it lines up. And the last thing, of course, is give any feedback on the format, what you want to see in the future. I do take suggestions well, like I actually, this first video was a suggestion on Twitter. So feel free to reach out via YouTube comments or Twitter and let me know what you guys think. Um, but we will be doing more of these. They do take a little bit to make because I'm not super tech savvy and I, I don't actually know what type of format I want to do. But I thought PowerPoint presentation would be the best way. I just graduated uni and I, I thought like lectures, like this is a PUBG lecture essentially. It's like about learning. So try and give you a lecture style content and um, so you can just speed through. So anyway, thank you so much for watching and uh, let me know what you want to see in the future. But for the next lecture, we're going to just dive into the introduction to competitive PUBG principles. We'll go over a lot of definitions, a lot of terminology. We'll start, um, we'll start talking about some things that players all know and maybe viewers don't. So we'll start talking about that and get more into the nitty gritty as future episodes come along. So thank you so much for watching.